All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be a part of the webinar entitled At Home Gardening and Backyard Composting. This is a webinar that is a part of our pollution prevention webinar series that we host quarterly. So if it's something that you like, you're interested in, um, reach out and, and then we'll make sure that you're on the list that gets these invitations uh, for, the, for the webinar series. Uh, my name is Caleb Powell and I am an environmental scientist for the Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices here at TDEC, which stands for the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. I will be hosting the webinar today for our wonderful speakers. Everyone is muted upon entry to reduce the amount of background noise, but if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to ask those in the chat box, and I will work on asking those to our speakers. Um, you can ask your questions whenever you'd like, but what we're going to do is we'll, um, I will ask those questions to our speakers at the end of the presentations, just so that they can get through their, their slides and um, they possibly could answer the questions um, with some of their, their slides um, later on. But um, I'm going to go ahead and send a chat right now to everyone so everyone can sort of see where where the um, that chat box is. So like I said, feel free to send messages whenever you would like, and then we will get those answered towards the end. Um, there's a drop-down portion of the chat box that lets you choose who can see your questions. Um, and so basically, if you want other people to see your questions, then that just put all attendees, but if you just wanted to send privately to me, um, I am the host, so you can just send that straight to the host, um, whichever you feel comfortable with. So to give you an overview of what we're going to be covering today, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant disruptions to all aspects of society and emphasized the importance of community and household resilience through self-reliance. Two practices that enhance community and household self-reliance while also providing environmental benefits are at-home gardening and back yard composting. In this webinar, TDEX Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices plans to highlight information, including tips and tricks, on how to start your own garden and backyard compost setup. So our presenters have a wealth of knowledge and experience that will help us better understand how to start and take care of our, gar our own garden and then also um, have a little compost pile. So with that being said, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Kelsey Davis. And you might be able to see her. Um, she's got her video camera up, up and going, her webcam. So Kelsey is an environmental consultant with the Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices, where her primary focus is co-managing the Go Green With Us program in, in the Tennessee State Parks. Kelsey also works to promote environmental awareness through sustainable events, workshops, training, and technical assistance. Her prior experience and training includes solid waste management and recycling, green building, and ecological ecological economics. That's a, that's a tongue twister. Uh, she holds uh, her lead green associate credential, and she also holds a bachelor's of science in business economics from the University of Memphis and a master's in sustainability from David Lipscomb University. So without further ado, I will pass over the presenting capabilities to Kelsey. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So um, as Caleb graciously said, I am an environmental consultant, also with the Poli Office of Policy and Sustainable Practices. Um, I do technical assistance for the Tennessee State Parks that compost, as well as some of our schools across the state that participate in our Green Schools program and compost. So I'm pretty familiar with composting operations of all sizes, but today we are going to be talking about backyard composting. So to understand composting, you really need to know how it works and what it is. This is a fancy definition, but I like to say that composting is the controlled and accelerated breakdown of organic material into a beneficial soil amendment. So this is the natural decomposition process that happens in nature. And composting really is the accelerated process of this, this right here that happens in nature. So the flow chart, you can kind of see how it works. And what we're going to be doing is this in a much faster, but also a much smaller scale process. So why would we compost in the first place? There are many different reasons, but the three that I'm going to talk about today 
are that first and foremost, it conserves energy and natural resources. So by composting in your backyard, you are eliminating the need to spend energy transporting the compostable materials that would end up going to a landfill. Compost also improves um, the much needed topsoil. There is an issue with erosion and with our topsoil, um, since we're such a farming country, with it losing its nutrients, and compost is incredibly effective at improving our topsoil. It can also reduce landfill space and the portion, the production of methane that that gives off. So when food and other um, woody materials, such as yard trimmings, get put in a landfill, they actually decompose anaerobically, meaning they don't have access to oxygen, so when they break down, they give off a lot of methane which is a really potent greenhouse gas. So by diverting food and yard trimming out of our landfill, it reduces the amount of methane that we're giving off, as well as saves about 30% of things that are going into the landfill right now. So what are some things that you can do with compost? The most popular thing is to just incorporate it into your soil. Anywhere where you have maybe some hard clay or not ideal soil that you're trying to get something to grow, compost is an excellent soil amendment that will help your plants or whatever you're trying to grow get better nutrients. I add it to my garden. I also incorporate it into the soil, but specifically in my garden. You can do this either through tilling or you can just add the compost directly into the hole that you're about to plant whatever vegetable in. You can also use it for potting soil. I also will mix it into my potting soil for my potted plants, such as flowers and things like that. Top dress lawn areas and mulching around plants, these are both options where you don't actually incorporate the compost into the soil, but you place it on top of the soil. In this case, nature's natural process as well as rain will help the um, compost actually get down into the top soil. It will just take a little bit longer. One thing you need to remember when you're mulching around your plants is to make sure that your compost is completely finished. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but when your compost is breaking down, it actually warms up, it puts off heat. So the last thing you wanna do is put a hot mulch around your plants because it could make them wilt or even die. And then compost actually has a excellent water retention rate, so it's great for erosion control and bioremediation. So what are some of the benefits of using compost? As you can see in this diagram to the right, adding compost greatly improves the structure of the soil. It reduces the need for synthetic fertilizers. Compost itself is not a fertilizer, that's important to remember, but it does have a lot of excellent nutrients for your plants. And um, like I mentioned earlier, it improves water um, retention rates of your soil, which is also great for your plants. Okay, so this is a very basic equation that I like to use for your four ingredients that you need for compost. You need your greens, your browns, air, and water. And with all of these four things, you get compost. So the flow chart below the equation kind of shows a more detailed example of your inputs and your outputs that you will have with your compost. The oxygen and the moisture or the air and the water that I just mentioned, and you will actually be controlling these items yourself. And then, of course, you need microorganisms to break down your greens and your browns to actually turn it into compost. You will not be adding the microorganisms or really managing that yourself. That all happens naturally. Our browns are our carbon sources and our greens are nitrogen. These help each other break down and form compost. So as this is happening, as you can see, it releases energy in the form of heat. So if you're doing it properly, you will actually be able to see your compost pile give off steam, and it will actually be warmer than the ambient temperature. And that means it's working, that's a good thing. So then after all of this, the compost will actually release water or moisture back into the atmosphere, as well as a little bit of carbon dioxide, and then you will remain with compost. So now let's talk about our greens and our browns in more depth. For greens, as far as backyard composting goes, your main green is going to be your fruit and vegetable scraps from your kitchen probably. 
potato peelings and leftover vegetable parts that you don't normally eat, things like that are probably going to be your main green. Grass clippings also make a great green. Um, one thing to remember about grass clippings is that while they're fresh, they're green, but if you actually let them dry, they're brown. So that one can get a little bit tricky. Breads and grains. Coffee grounds, this also includes tea and tea bags. You just want to make sure if you're putting the filters in your compost that it is a compost safe um, filter that is only paper. Make sure it doesn't have any microplastics in it before you're putting it in your compost. And then hair and fur is actually a good green. Um, I have two German Shepherds that live inside with me, so when I vacuum, I will actually put the hair into my compost, and it's a great way to get rid of it, and it's just one less thing that I have to put in the landfill. So as far as your browns go, wood chips are excellent. Sticks and twigs are usually pretty easy to come by. Dried leaves, um, make sure to stay away from wet leaves or green fresh leaves. They tend to weigh down your compost pile and, and make it a little too compacted. Shredded paper is great. It's also a great way to get rid of any documents um, that you need to safely dispose of. Just shred them and add them to your compost. And then cardboard and paperboard are also great for browns. You just need to remember to tear them up into smaller pieces and make sure they don't have any wax coating on them. So everything on the bottom side that says do not add are things that are not compostable and could create problems for your compost pile. Um, I'm not going to read every single one of them, but some of the main ones to remember are dairy, any type of meat, and oils. So when you're cooking, if you have some sort of leftover um, vegetable, for example, maybe green beans or something that you cooked with ham in it, I wouldn't put those in your compost because they have the fats and oils from that meat incorporated into them. So here's just a few green tips that I've learned um, from providing technical assistance and a few questions that I've come across that I just thought would be good to go ahead and include in this presentation. So your produce, your fruits and vegetable scraps can either be raw or cooked. They don't only have to be raw. You can put cooked things, leftovers in there as long as they don't have dairy or fats like we just discussed. Always be sure to remove your produce stickers. Now this one's tricky. I've gotten into the habit of taking off the stickers as soon as I get home and unload my groceries because it can be difficult to remember, but they will not break down. So if worse comes to worse and you forget a few, when you're adding your compost to whatever, just kind of pick them out because you'll be able to see them. Chop up any large items. You don't want to put a whole watermelon run or maybe a whole pumpkin or something after Halloween. You want to make sure it's smaller items and that's just so that your compost keeps more of a consistent size and structure. Check that your tea bags contain no plastic. I already mentioned that one. Um, never add plants that may be diseased. So if you're gardening in tandem with your compost, make sure that if you have to rip up a plant because it's got wilted or some sort of um, disease that you don't want to spread to something else, don't put it in your compost. And then of course, Never, ever, ever, ever add weeds to your compost. By the off chance that it, is, it doesn't get hot enough to kill the seeds, when you spread your compost, you will literally just be spreading weeds. So that is a big no-no. Okay, so brown tips. Wood chips are by far your best brown. I am lucky enough to actually have a wood shop. My husband does woodworking, so I have all of the wood chips and wood shavings that I could ever want. But for... Um, Many people who don't have that, there are many other ways you can get access to wood chips. Many local tree cutting services will actually come and dump a load in your yard for free because they have nothing else to do with them. Same with local utility departments. Sawmills sometimes will let you come get a load of wood shavings or wood chips. Um, wood shops as far as schools, we've actually had a few like high schools that have wood shops donate their wood chips. And you can always use last year's mulch. That's something that I do. I will rake up a, a, the top layer of last year's mulch before we remulch, and I'll actually put that in my compost, and it works great. I've already mentioned the grass clippings. If they're fresh, they're green. If they're dried, they're brown. Try to avoid using too many leaves. A good tip is to always start your compost pile with a layer of brown directly on the ground. You don't want to put your compost pile on top of, say, a slab of concrete or on gravel because that inhibits a lot of the good um, insects and microorganisms from having access to your compost. 
and you always want to cover your greens with more browns. So every time I empty my kitchen scraps bucket into my compost, I try to put wood chips on it immediately. And we'll talk more about why that's important a little later on. So now that you know about your greens and your browns, let's actually talk about how you compost. First, you're gonna to need to select the location, then you will have to get a bin. You wanna make sure that you are um, putting your organic material in proper amounts. Then you will have to actually manage the compost pile, which will be stirring and adding water, which adds the air and the oxygen out of our equation that we talked about earlier. And then you're gonna watch your compost, make sure that it is working properly, screen it and then age it, and then of course, use it. So for a location, you want it to be dry and semi-shady. You don't want to put it in the middle of the sun. It can mess with your temperatures and prevent your microorganisms from being healthy and successful in breaking down your compost. You want it to be near a water source, and you also want it to be in a very convenient location. The water source has a little bit to do with the convenience because you want to make sure that your compost has um, about as, it's about as wet as a wrung out sponge. And if it's dry, let's say August, and you're not getting a whole lot of rain, the best way for you to do that is to have access to a water hose or a nearby rain barrel. You also don't want it to be too far from wherever you're going to be producing your greens. For example, my kitchen is by my back patio and my compost bin is around the corner of my back patio. If it was too terribly far away, people tend to get lazy and not compost because the compost bin is not in a convenient location. So. Make sure that it's somewhere that you're willing to walk to. Okay, so there's a few different types of composters. This is the one that I like and I highly recommend it. Um, it has a door at the bottom that you can slide up to get the finished compost and it has a locking lid on the top to prevent critters from getting in it, which is great. There are tumbler composter options and this I would only recommend for highly advanced composters who really want to spend a lot of time with their compost, making sure it is absolutely perfect. This is because it doesn't have direct access to the ground and it is just a little bit more difficult to manage. Or you can always make your own bin. Um, you can just have a pile, maybe up against a back wall or something. The one on the top right, you can actually use cylinder blocks to make a aisle or a um, tray like that. You can use T-posts and chicken wire, like in the bottom left. Or you can use old pallets, which is also something that um, a lot of our composting schools have done, and it works very well. And you can usually get pallets for free. So this is the most important part out of the entire presentation. If you don't get anything else out of this, listen to this. Three to one is your ratio of browns to greens. This will determine the success of your compost pile. So for every one bucket of greens, Every one bucket of produce that I'm gonna to add to my compost, I need to add three buckets of wood chips or of twigs and yard debris or dried grass. So that is very, very important. Like I mentioned earlier, you wanna chop it up, make sure you don't have any larger items. Empty your kitchen collector or whatever um, bucket you're using and then stir. I will confess that I don't actually stir every single time that I add greens. Sometimes I'll add greens and then cover them with browns and do that maybe for a week or two and then stir. And that's okay too. And then of course you want to cover it. Always cover it with browns and then also be sure to put your lid back on your composter if you have one. So this is a nice little uh, diagram that I like to use. It's been the most effective and visually intriguing to people to understand. So let's pretend that our compost pile is a compost cake. So as you can see on the bottom, I've started out with browns, and I've also put browns up the sides of my compost bin. You can do this if you have an earth machine that you're going to use, or if you have one of those saws that we talked about. And this is just so that when you do stir your compost, it brings in an extra source of those browns to kind of mix it all in and make sure that it's getting nice and aerated and you have a good structure to your compost. And as you can see, after every layer of cake that is green, I top it with a layer of brown. So that's just a good visual that really sticks with people. Okay, so now let's talk about proper porosity. The top of this diagram are the preferred and the bottom are 
a little bit too tight and you might not um, have great success with your compost. You want to make sure that your particles are not uniform enough that you can have air in between them. Air is really important for the microorganisms and if your um, compost pile gets too way down, it will almost get kind of sludgy and it won't break down appropriately and you'll start to have a smell. So you want to make sure that, and this is where the wood chips come in really handy, they're big enough that they allow um, some mixed particle size, but also yard debris and small twigs can do the same thing. Okay, so after you've been adding your greens and your browns in the proper ratio, you need to make sure to stir and add water as necessary. I will be the first to admit that I will take the lid off of my composter if I know it's going to rain because why would I worry about having to water it myself if I could just take off the lid and let nature do it for me? So that is the best way to compost, to water your compost. Um, but of course, if it hasn't rained in a while, you will need to add a little bit of water, either from your water hose or um, a watering can or something similar. There are a few tools I have pictured below that are great to just stir your compost with. One is a pitchfork, um, and the other one is actually a compost turner. That's what it looks like. I use a spade sometimes too. They work good if you have um, larger things in there that you need to chop up. So I will kind of chop and mix at the same time and that works really well for me. Okay, so like we talked about earlier in that flow chart, your compost pile should steam. This is actually one of the compost piles at the state park and you can see it is working properly because you can actually physically see the steam coming off of it and when you put your hands up close to it, it is warm. So this means your compost pile is still working. You will want to keep turning your pile as long as you see steam coming off of it. Once you no longer see steam, you can turn it again. And then if it doesn't steam anymore, your compost is probably close to finished. So here are some other tips that you can determine if your compost is ready. The temperature of the pile will be the same as the surrounding air. It will smell earthy, almost just like really good soil. It will no longer heat up after it's turned, and it will look like it's pictured here. You won't be able to see identifiable food items. That one's really important. With mine, sometimes I'll think it's ready, but I will go in there and turn it and maybe find an avocado peel or some eggshells, and I know it still has a little bit of time to go. That being said, you can also screen your compost. So this is really good if you have some random items left, but everything else in your compost looks really good and dark like that picture. You can screen out some of those bigger items and then use your finished compost that's left and take those items that you screened out and put them in a new compost pile. Those items will actually inoculate your new compost pile a lot faster because they already have all of those good microorganisms on them and it will just help your um, new compost pile be much more healthy and successful. And then lastly, I always recommend aging your compost. So after you've done that, even though I'm sure you're ready to use your compost, it's always a good idea to let it sit for a month, maybe two or three, just to make sure there's nothing still active in there. Um, the last thing you wanna do is use your compost too soon and actually hurt the plants that you're trying to provide all of those good nutrients to. So last but not least, troubleshooting. I will say more often than not, if you're having an issue, the first thing you need to make sure you're doing right is the proper ratios. But if you are making sure that you have enough browns to your greens, then if your material isn't decomposing, something you can do is to make sure you add water. Maybe you've let your pile get too dry and it's not breaking down. Or you can add more greens. That's another way of actually adding a little bit more moisture as well. If it has an ammonia odor, that's when your pile is not getting enough browns and it will kind of start to break down and turn into a sludgy material. That is when you need to add more browns to kind of add more oxygen in there and uh, add a little bit more carbon. If it has a rotten odor, you need to also add more wood chip because it will add more air and turn the pile. It just needs to get a little bit more air in there so that it can break down properly. If you have vermin, then I would recommend trying a different type of composter, especially if you were just maybe using a pile. A great way is just to get an earth machine and that will solve that problem. 
However, another good reason is to just always make sure you're covering really, really well with your browns, and that will usually deter any type of vermin. They shouldn't be able to smell it if you're covering it appropriately. And then here are a few additional resources if you had any questions about anything or just are curious and want to look into it a little bit more. And that is it for me. I will answer your questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Kelsey. And we actually had a few. Oh, there's some background. I'm not sure. If is it me? Possibly. All right, let's see. try muting. All right, let's see. Um, so there's a we actually had a few questions for you, um, Kelsey. And if you if if you don't mind, we might go ahead and just ask them right now. We're a little bit of, we're right on time. So um, we had a question that says, "What's the problem with adding things with fat to animal products?" Um, and then they they gave the um, comment, it will it just attract animals, or is there some uh, another reason? So residential composting piles are small enough that they will not actually reach a temperature to get hot enough to break down those items. The state park, for example, will compost um, post consumer waste out of their restaurants, and they do accept meat, even bones and fats and things like that, because their piles are probably five cubic yards, or yours will be much, much smaller. So it's just a heat issue. Um, there also is a vermin issue, but it, it's more about not getting hot enough to actually handle those materials. Awesome. We had one that says, can you use treated pallets? Um, or should they be, be non-treated for, I guess, for the, um, mm -hmm. for the stall? So ideally, I would use non-treated because those chemicals can actually leach into your compost. And the last thing you want to do is to spread those chemicals in your compost. But a lot of places have just heat treated and you can check on the stamp. We actually have um, a guide on our website that shows you what the different stamps are and what to look for but you definitely want to choose the heat treated over the chemically treated. Awesome. Um, and actually one more just came in for you. Um, are there concerns about ink from the paper and the cardboard? No, that has never been a concern or any type of training I've ever been through. It's never really been mentioned. So um, I would have to say don't use paper or cardboard as your only brown, but I do add maybe um, a gallon bucket of shredded paper to mine probably once a month, and I've never had any, any issues at all. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for all this insight um, on making your own compost pile at, at home. So if you have any more questions, um, feel free to send those. We'll, we'll do another question ask for Kelsey um, or everybody um, at the very end. So let's see, we'll go to, and there is um, Kelsey's contact information if you need to get a hold of her. Um, and then, so next, we are going to be talking about gardening, at home gardening. Um, we and I guess I can um, introduce our next speaker, Lucas Holman. He is he grew up in the horticulture industry, working for a wholesale operation up until college. He majored in agriculture with a concentration in horticulture at Tennessee Tech. After college, he began teaching agriculture in high school for almost ten years. Currently, he is the horticulture extension agent for Wilson County and the coordinator for the Wilson County Master Gardener Program. And personally, uh, he's a good friend of mine. He actually was my ag teacher back in high school. And I can truly say that he is the most knowledgeable person uh, that I know uh, when it comes to anything to do with plants. I can send him uh, a picture of, of, of a, a flower or a leaf or um, a, a trunk of a tree, and he can tell me the scientific and the um, the um, regular name of it. So he is going to tell us a little bit about vegetable gardening, uh, the do's and don'ts, and give, just give us some good tips and tricks. So without further ado, you've got presenting capabilities. Let's see. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. 
Uh, I appreciate that, Caleb. Way to make my head bigger. As we go through this, I want you to put questions in the chat box because you're here to learn and we're here to teach you. So me and Kelsey both, uh, we appreciate all the questions that you have. So hopefully I am loud enough as we kind of go through this. I'm going to basically go through the basics of home vegetable gardening. So I'm, I broke this up into two classifications. I broke this up into cool season versus warm season vegetables. So as we go into summertime in Tennessee, we're going to start hitting days that are 90, 95, and even 100 degree days sometime as we go into August. Cool season vegetables such as broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, lettuce, bok choy, Brussels sprouts, kale, all of those greens are not going to live. And I think sometimes we need to be planting the right things at the right time. So we, we sometimes don't have successes in our garden because we're not planting them at the right time. So I want to encourage you, if you're going to do cool season vegetables, all these green type things, they need to be done between March, April, and May, and September, October, November. Right now is a terrible time to be planting lettuce, broccoli, cauliflower, and cabbage because you're not going to have any success. It's going to bolt, which means it's going to set seed and it's going to start tasting really bitter. So it's going to be a waste of your time and a waste of your money. But right now you can still do warm season vegetables. So I broke this presentation up at the beginning and we're going to be covering cool season vegetables. And then we're going to be covering warm season vegetables. And at the very end, cover a little bit about a few insect problems that we have. So as a rule of thumb, if you're going to be growing something in the cool season vegetable family that forms a head, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, it needs to be started as a transplant and then planted outside. So if it's a green, lettuce, uh, kale, turnips, mustard, collards, they can be broadcast out. So if it forms a head, it needs to be started inside. So ideally, for Wilson County, and I'm in Wilson County, so it says Wilson County a couple of times in there, but that's pretty much for, the, for all of Middle Tennessee. It needs to be started about six or seven weeks inside before you transplant it. So this fall, if I've decided I'm going to grow cabbage and broccoli, the ideal time to plant cool season vegetables is about the third week of September, which means I'm going to count back six or seven weeks and start my cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower seeds inside my house to actually transplant them outside. And if you've got any questions, all the extension agents across Middle Tennessee will be glad to help you. And if you're in other parts of the state, there are extension agents everywhere who can kind of help you figure out when to plant all these things. But I wanted to let you know that's a general rule of thumb, six or seven weeks inside. Outside in the springtime, if I'm growing cool season vegetables, I need to get my cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower planted about the second or third week of January inside to transplant it outside March the 15th. We call them cool season vegetables because, number one, they can handle a light frost, and even some of them will begin to taste a little better whenever they've had a, a, uh, a good frost on top of them. So here's a good little chart that actually comes from one of the University of Tennessee publications on vegetable gardening. And it kind of tells you which ones you can direct seed into the ground and which ones you need to buy a transplant for. It's a challenge to just go buy tomato seeds and broadcast tomato seeds. It's just not really going to work that well. Sometimes they need to be babied inside. So this is just a quick little chart. And if you want to, you can email me. I can send you all these charts. And uh, I'll put my contact information in the chat box later. But I wanted to encourage you, some things prefer to be direct seeded in the ground. Some things need to be started inside the house and then transplanted outside. So kind of jumping on through all these cool season vegetables, you can start sowing some of your greens outside about August the 20th. Now that changes every year. Last year, August the 20th, we were still in the 90s. That would have been a terrible time to do that. And it's always good to kind of watch for that 7 to 10 day forecast. If we start seeing the night temperatures get in the 40s, the 50s, that's fine to plant greens then. And we always know all the meteorologists are always right to begin with, so you can always trust what they're going to say, right? <laughs> also, those things that form ahead, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, they need to be planted outside about the 10th of September. Kind of going down the list real fast, you've got two categories of cool season vegetables, very cold hardy and moderately cold hardy. Very cold hardy, which would be things that can handle quite a few frosts, um, cabbage, mustard, Carrots, onions, collards, all of these uh, 
kohlrabi, radish, lettuce, and spinach, and moderately cold hardy, which means uh, they can't handle as many frosts, but they can handle some light frost. Swiss chard, turnips, cauliflower, broccoli, and beets. I want to mention some of the root vegetables. Turnips, uh, there's another one on here, carrots. Last year I visited, two years ago, I visited a lady at her garden, and she was still pulling carrots out of her garden in February because the ground is a natural insulator. And what do you think they did for food a couple hundred years ago? They had stuff stored in root cellars. So potatoes they would leave in the ground and just dig them up whenever they needed them. The same principle goes for carrots. You can have carrots if you plant them in the fall time. You can have carrots all the way through the winter time. <laughs> Kind of going through, I'm going to break it up into each individual one. These are just some great varieties of some things to grow. If you're going to grow anything in the family called Brassicaceae, which is cabbage relatives, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, Brussels sprouts, you're going to have a bug called the cabbage looper. You're going to have it. You're going to have to probably treat it. And it's a little bitty white moth that actually flies around at night, and you're like, oh, it's a cute little moth. It lays its eggs on the cabbage on the bottom of the leaves, and then you wake up one night, and the whole leaf is chewed up. That's that little bitty cabbage looper. It's also a cabbage worm. But I wanted to make sure you can treat with an organic insecticide called Bacillus thuringiensis. It also comes by another name called Dipel. But it's a powder that you can actually use on leaves. No harm to humans whatsoever only hurts soft-bodied worm insects. Looking at the different varieties, you can start getting seed catalogs and you'll have a ton of varieties to choose from. In Tennessee, these were some of the recommended varieties. Stonehead is a smaller headed cabbage, Savoy King is a wrinkled head, and Early Jersey Wakefield is a pointed head. Super Red Eddie is a red uh, variety. Broccoli varieties, Pac-Man, Premium Crop, and Arcadia. Cauliflower varieties, we have a lot of new cauliflower varieties that are purple. We have some that are orange, so the purple and orange ones are called Cheddar and Graffiti. They taste just like the white one. Kohlrabi, if you've never grown and tried kohlrabi, it's a swollen bulb at the base of the ground. It's in the cabbage family, and it's great in slaw. And Brussels sprouts, Jade Cross, and Oliver are two varieties that we've been recommending for Tennessee. Now, out of all of these to grow in Tennessee, Russell sprouts are probably going to be the most challenging, and most people probably won't have a lot of luck with them because they take anywhere from 90 to 110 days from the time you plant them, and generally it gets too hot too fast for them to actually set fruit. Okay, so Russell sprouts, you're going to have good years and you're going to have bad years. Looking at some other varieties of, that are just basically my favorites on some of these things, any of the lettuces do fine, but when it gets hot, it's going to bowl, it's going to set seeds. Salad bowl is a leaf lettuce, black seeded Simpson is a leaf lettuce, and red cells is a leaf lettuce. I think the leaf lettuces do better than some of the head lettuces in Tennessee. I love kale, and people need to be eating more kale. Vates, dwarf blue, dark abor, lacinato, spinach. The one that's been around probably 80 or 90 years is called Bloomsdale Long Standing, and it's still the best spinach to actually plant today. Garlic, oh man, there's nothing I love more than garlic. And I think out of all the things I'm going to talk about today, garlic is probably the easiest vegetable to grow in Tennessee. If you can't grow garlic, you probably shouldn't even begin to garden to begin with. Find a new hobby completely. It is so simple. Garlic needs to be planted in the fall time between September and October, and you dig it up right now. So encourage your friends, quit buying garlic and just plant it. Onions, Texas Super Sweet Granix. You know Granix by another name, Vidalia, but we can't call it Vidalia because it's not grown in Vidalia, Georgia. Candy, Superstar. And then collards, the two staple varieties of collards are Georgia and Vates. I want to encourage you to look at a group of vegetables called AAS winners, and this stands for All American Selection Winners. These were vegetables that were actually trialed everywhere from Florida to Washington, from California to Maine, and a, and a ton of different public gardens and universities all across the U.S., and they give a little stamp to a vegetable if it has deemed worthy enough of having it. 
So if you ever see tags, you're going to the store to buy vegetable plants, and you see that little tag that says AAS winner, that means it's been trialed all across the U.S. and it has done exceedingly well. So that may be something you want to try out. That okra on the left was a newer one. That's an AAS winner called Candle Fire. And the uh, fennel uh, in the middle, I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> And I wanted to show you, here's some other uh, award-winning peppers that have come out over the past couple of years. Most of them have been uh, All-American selection winners. And I, I kind of broke this down on how to plant some of these things for just a few more minutes. Onions, you can plant three different ways. You can buy the sets, you can buy the bulbs, you can buy the seeds. Easiest way to plant onions is by the sets. Now, onions need to be planted in Tennessee about the last week of February. I don't know that's crazy. If you're planting onion sets or onion bulbs, they need to go in the ground basically at the end of winter. If you plant them too late, they usually don't develop a big bulb. Carrots, radishes, and turnips, the very first thing you've got to have on these things is loose soil. And if the soil is rocky, or if it's got hard pans, or if it's clay that's really packed down, it's not going to grow right. You're going to get some really ugly carrots out there. Uh, cover loosely with a dusting of soil. You can plant seeds too deep. So if I was actually planting my radishes this year, I'm going to make a little bitty furrow about a half an inch deep, gently place my seeds, and then take some of the soil near it and actually dust it over the top and then keep it moist. If you're trying to encourage kids to garden, these things are really simple. All three of these, carrots, the radish, and the turnips, they're really simple to grow. They're really to get, easy to get started, and they last a long time. But thinning is usually required on these things because the seeds on carrots and radishes and turnips are so small, it's impossible to plant one every inch. Unless you use needle, uh, needles or something like that, uh, tweezers or something like that. Kale, mustard, and collards are all some of the leafy type things, which means you can actually direct plant seeds into the garden. Make sure you're watching for bugs. We're not going to see a lot of the bug damage until sometimes it's too far. So I want to encourage you, whenever you buy plants at the store, look under the leaves. Look at the roots. Take the plants out of the container and actually look at them to see if you're bringing home diseased plants that you're going to introduce to your garden. And look at some of these because there are amazing new varieties of each one that are coming out. Uh, that's a newer kale right there. And this is one of my friend's pictures of kale. That one's called Red Boar. Beautiful edible kale. Swiss chard, peas, and leeks are all kind of in that same cool season family. Easy to grow, but they need to be planted at the right time. For the most part, a lot of these need to be planted about the first or second week of March. Whenever they start coming up, they can still handle frost. And don't forget about bok choy. It's also in that same plant family also. Kind of going into warm season vegetables. And these are basically everybody's bread and butter. So these are things like eggplant, corn, tomatoes, peppers. This is what everybody loves to grow in the summertime. Generally, most of them need to be started inside about eight weeks before you can actually transplant them. Now, for the most part, most warm season vegetables can be planted outside in Tennessee between April the 15th and April the 20th, which means take that date that you want to plant your tomatoes, count back eight weeks. That's when you should start your tomato seeds. That's when you should start your pepper seeds. And that's when you should start your eggplants. Now, some things like to be direct planted. Watermelons, squash, cucumbers, corn, beans are the big ones that you don't need to start inside. And I'll talk about those in just a second. Uh, most of these warm season vegetables prefer 65 degree soil temperatures in order for the roots to actually grow. So even though the atmospheric temperature is 75 or 80 degrees, the soil temperature can still only be 50 degrees. So you can actually buy soil thermometers. And I know Kelsey was talking about compost. You can get giant thermometers to check the temperature of your compost pile. Use that to check the temperature of your soil. If the soil temperature is below 65, then some of these warm season vegetables are going to struggle. Transplanting, I, I prefer to usually start my own tomatoes, my own peppers, because I'm very picky on the varieties. And I'm very opinionated about which varieties I think grow well in Tennessee. And easy, 
And I like starting my own seeds because it shortens my time to production. Uh, it will reduce the seed cost sometimes. And also thinning isn't always required. So some tomatoes, if I know I'm going to plant beef steak, I'm probably not going to buy a package of beef steak seeds. I'm just going to go buy a package of beef steak. But if I'm trying to find a very specific type of tomato, I'm probably going to have to start the seeds myself. Uh, also on transplanting, we see a lot of squash plants, pumpkins, watermelons as transplants. If it's a cucurbit, cucumbers, squash, zucchini, cantaloupe, watermelon, they have really sensitive roots and you can break the base of the stem also and, and kill the plant. I prefer a lot of these vining type crops, a lot of the squash crops to be direct seeded into the ground. <clears throat> also, there is some added cost over time if you're going to transplant. If you're direct planting seeds, you've got to make sure the soil is warm enough. If I go out and plant my bean and corn seed the first week of April, when soil temperatures are still 40 to 45, those seeds are going to sit in moist soil and they're going to rot. And then I'm going to have to go back to the store. I'm going to have to buy more seeds and the co-op will sell them to you again. <laughs> So just make sure you're planting them at the right time. Seeds are cheaper than transplants, and I prefer direct seeding cucumbers, squash, beans, corn, and peas. One of my favorite quotes was, a world without tomatoes is like a string quartet without violins. Couldn't tell you who said that, but I think if you are a gardener, you need to eat tomatoes. But we have two types of tomatoes, so you need to make sure what you're going to do with the tomatoes. A determinate tomato pretty much will set all of its fruit at one time. So if you are a canning person or you're going to make salsa, you're going to make your spaghetti sauce, you would want a determinate tomato that will set all of its fruit at one time. Roma, San Marzano, Celebrity are kind of the three determinate tomatoes that most people use now because they want their juice, they want their salsa, they want their spaghetti sauce at one time. If you want tomatoes sporadically throughout the whole summer, then you're going to buy something called indeterminate, which means it fruits over a long period of time. Tomatoes, you shouldn't direct plant them by seeds. You need to transplant them. And there's a lot of heated debate over people suckering tomatoes and people not suckering tomatoes. I put mine in a cage, and I don't sucker them. If you are trying to keep your tomatoes attached to a stake, then you're probably going to have to sucker them. I don't think I included any pictures of a sucker, but we can talk about that later. I'll try to get pictures if you're asking for pictures of what a sucker on a tomato looks like. This is why we do it, folks. We love tomatoes in the summertime. And the varieties that we can get today, we can get everything from purple, yellow, green, white, orange, oh, and all the shades in between. And they all have their own distinct flavors and tastes. Now, peppers, you need to do these from transplants also. You can plant hot and sweet peppers together. That's an old gardening myth, that I can't plant my jalapenos beside my bell peppers. It'll make my bell peppers hot. That's a myth. I plant my jalapenos in my same little garden that I do with my other peppers. It's only an issue if I save those seeds next year. So this green bell pepper here is called California Wonder. And if I planted a jalapeno right next to it, the pollen will go to it. Then the seeds from that are actually a cross of California Wonder Cross of the Jalapeno. Theoretically, that could happen. So you're not really supposed to save them like that because they're open pollinator for the most part. Pollen can fly pretty easily. Some uh, really good varieties that grow well in Tennessee. Red Knight is a beautiful red bell pepper. I grew that one a couple years ago. California Wonder is the staple green bell pepper. And Summer Sunset, Hot, Mad Hatter, Emerald Fire is a jalapeno type, and Flaming Fire. Uh, there are some beautiful ornamental peppers, but they're also extremely hot. But they add some great appeal to the landscape. Black Pearl and Black Hawk are two of them. And there's some other ones called Poinsettia and Medusa now. I love peppers. Out of all the vegetables, uh, warm season vegetables, they're one of the easier ones to grow. Now, tomatoes can have some wilt diseases, uh, but peppers usually are pretty forgiving. Squash, you can do seeds or transplants. I prefer using direct seeds into the ground. I think they do better. You're going to have two issues with squash, squash vine borer and squash bug. Right now, if you've got squash out, 
you're going to start seeing little bitty tiny coppery eggs on the leaf. You can use spinosad, neem, you can use some uh, synthetic pyrethrums to actually take care of these. Once squash bugs kind of get on your plant, it's usually got an expiration date and you need to treat it or actually get it out of your garden really fast. Some great varieties, Coco Zell, Golden Zucchini, Super Zet, and Zephyr. Zephyr is the cool one that you see at farmer's markets now. It's actually half green and it's half yellow. That's Coco Zell on the left and that's just a Golden Zucchini on the right. Okra you can do from seed or you can do from transplant. The issue with okra, it'll make you itch. If you've ever been trying to pick okra in a patch and you're not wearing a long sleeve shirt, you want to go take a shower as soon as you get done because it makes you itch real bad. Okra really doesn't have any bug or disease problems. The best one was developed by Clemson University of almost 100 years ago called Clemson Spineless, but it still has spines on it and it can still make you itch pretty good. Corn, they need to be direct seeded into the ground after the danger of frost. You have a couple of different branches of corn. You have sweet corns, you have dent corn, or we'll call it field corn. Sweet corn are the ones we generally eat off the cob. Filled corns will be like some of the older varieties called Hickory King. They don't really have a lot of sweet characteristics to them. Some good varieties include Honey Select, Silver Queen, Incredible, and Challenger. Beans, they need to be planted after frost. Tip, they're direct sown also into the ground. The main issue with beans is sometimes we don't read the packages. We'll have some that'll say bush, and we'll have some that'll say pole. Bush beans do not need to be staked. Pole beans need to have some type of support system, or they're not, they're not going to actually produce fruit well enough. So, if you're just looking to plant a small row of beans somewhere in your garden, and you're not one to actually stake them, but you're going to have to bend over to pick them, you need to plant bush beans. My favorite, and my mother's favorite, and some of my family members' favorite, is an older bush bean called Roma 2, and my mother, that's the one she cans every year. Eggplants, they're grown from transplants, and what's unique is that tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, and eggplants are all in the same plant family together called Solanaceae. So sometimes some tomato diseases, if you have an issue, can actually go to peppers, they can go to eggplants and they can also go to potatoes because they're all in that same plant family. Eggplants need to be a couple of feet apart. The best variety that's been around for a while, Black Beauty. Fairy Tail is the one that's actually shown here. I grew it in some of my landscape beds a couple of years ago. Uh, Kermit and Ikebon. Ikebon's a real long, skinny, dark purple one. Cucumbers, this was a little pickling kind that I had a couple of years ago. You can do seeds or transplants, but I, I think the seeds do better because sometimes the transplants are so brittle at the base where they actually uh, come up out of the container that you can break them when you're transplanting them. There are some cucumbers that are vining and some that are bush, so you can see in the name it'll say bush cucumber or stocky top cucumber. Um, some of the running types that do really well, fanfare, diva, lemon, and bush crop is another cucumber, but it doesn't have the vining type habit. But I wanted to show you this picture. I took this last year because I get questions every year this time of year. My cucumbers are blooming, but I have no fruit whatsoever. Cucumbers have two types of flowers. They have a male and they have a female. So what happens is a cucumber will flower a couple of weeks on male flowers, no female flowers. And what's it doing? It's trying to bring in pollinators to show, hey, we have pollen, come here, come here, come here. So that happens for a couple of weeks on pumpkins. A lot of the squash, cucumbers, gourds, um, cantaloupes, they'll have all these sets of flowers and no fruit for a couple of weeks. Don't panic. It's just the male flowers bringing in all the pollinators. But I wanted to show you the difference. A female flower will have an immature fruit, which is actually the, the type of ovary. Asparagus is a, is a perennial vegetable which means it actually comes back every year. You can still find asparagus in some of these old homesteads where the houses are gone, but the asparagus patch is still there. When you plant asparagus, from crowns especially, they're, they're easiest from roots. 
You need to leave it for a couple of years and not harvest anything. And it's what it's going to look like. It's not going to look good. It's going to look like a really weedy patch. But you need to leave it alone because all of those green stems are actually building energy for next year's stalks. A couple of great varieties are Jersey Knight and uh, Jersey Giant. Kind of going through my last couple of vegetables, watermelon cantaloupes, seeds or transplants, I prefer direct seeds. They need to be a couple of weeks after the frost. So we say generally our last frost date is about April the 15th. They need to be planted about the first week of May. Soil temperature needs to be closer to 70 on the cantaloupe side. Burpee hybrid and brosier are good ones. On the watermelon side, sugar baby, crimson sweet, and sunshine. The one thing you need for cantaloupe and watermelon is space. These vines can run 10 to 15 feet. So if you have a really small garden, if you've got some raised beds, watermelons and cantaloupes may not be your friend because they will take over everything else. A couple other quick slides, and I always encourage people, we have a lot of newer hybrids, and I understand the point of contention sometimes, we have some people say, I only want heirlooms, I only want heirlooms. Heirlooms do not have the best disease resistance, so they'll succumb to diseases like, for example, on tomatoes, fusarium wilt, verticillium wilt, and they'll have some bacterial diseases. A lot of the newer hybrids, even though they don't taste the same, really have some good disease resistance to them. If you can, find some of these disease-resistant disease -resistant varieties out there. And you can companion plant. Uh, here's some that has been researched. Cabbage and thyme will help keep some of the worms at bay. Eggplant and catnip for some of the flea beetles. You're going to have flea beetles on eggplant. I've, I'm having issues with it right now. Tomato and basil for hornworms. Beans and rosemary for bean beetles. But as in all things, you can have you know, on the insecticide side, biological, cultural, and you can even use some synthetic pesticides, which I've used a little bit of everything, and I think they all work well. But I think we need to know that not all bugs are bad. If you're looking at these two pictures, we see on the left aphids. That's a, I have an email right now I looked at of some guy with a tomato issue covered in aphids. Usually an insecticidal soap will work on some of those, but the insect on the right, the praying menace is a pretty good bug. Ladybugs are good bugs. So sometimes we don't want to say, I want to kill every bug in my garden because we're going to be killing some of the good ones along with the bad ones. And the last slide, I think this is it. If you were going to use an insecticide in your garden, make sure you're properly identifying the bug. And if you don't know, send a picture to your extension agent and they'll be able to tell you, yeah, this is flea beetle, this is cabbage looper. This is tomato hornworm. That way we know what we're actually dealing with and we can make recommendations on insecticides. And please read the label. The label is the law. And I get a question every day probably, well, how much do I mix? How much do I mix? The label tells you all that. I, I don't know because there's thousands of different types of pesticides out there. So you need to read the label yourself and actually figure it out because I can't tell you how much to mix. And also, a lot of the bugs can be controlled if we just eliminate some of the weed issues around our garden. So if you can take care of weeds around the garden, you're going to hopefully eliminate some of the bugs. Oh, that's it, buddy. Thank you so much uh, for all that information. And we actually have some good questions. I, that, that next slide is just something I wanted to um, include, and then we will jump right into those questions. Let's okay. See. So um, I, I, this is just a point uh, from the solid waste department, um, our household hazardous waste um, that they wanted to add it into this. Um, so due to the COVID, um, situ the current COVID situation, um, our household hazardous waste events um, right now, it'll probably be mid-September or later before we actually have those mobile events scheduled. Um, I have the website right there that goes to our household hazardous waste where you can look and and sort of get some tips and tricks of what to do with leftover um, insecticides or pesticides. Um, also, a, a good tip is to try to share or donate chemicals that you need to discard um, to, to other other people, your neighbors, um, if they're having similar type problems. But but I can't emphasize enough that it's very important to um, 
to read the directions and, and only put what you need on there. Um, it, and so it's also important to stay in contact with your county solid waste department for information on their local take back events for your um, household hazardous waste, uh, any type of insecticides or pesticides. Um, and stuff like that. So now we will go to the questions. We have a few questions. Um, the first, let's see. It says, so what, there was one about composting. It says, are dried grass clippings considered brown with greater carbon than nitrogen as fresh grass clippings are high in nitrogen? So I'm guessing um, like maybe what's the difference um, in the dried grass clippings um, in the non-dried, I guess. Okay, I'm assuming that one was for me. Can you repeat that? Yeah, sorry. Um, it says, are dried grass clippings considered a brown with greater carbon than nitrogen? Um, and then it says, as fresh grass clippings are high in nitrogen. So I'm guessing it's just like, yeah. what's the difference? It, it, does it the carbon and nitrogen switch out whenever it's dried or? Yes, so that is exactly right, and it has it loses its moisture as well. You'll notice a lot of the greens you're putting in have a higher moisture content. So once it dries out, it is basically only left with the dry, brittle carbon, um, which is why it is considered a brown after it's dried. And many other plants are the same way. Like if you have hay or pine needles, they're all the same. You know, when they're green, they're considered a green, and then if they have dried out, they would be considered a brown. Awesome. Oh. Uh so I guess the next one, there's quite a few that came in while you were talking, Lucas, it says, um, our cucumber plants have been in ground since early May. We put them in as starts, not seeds. They were doing great until about a week ago when the leaves started getting holes and they are wilting terribly, like almost dead. Any ideas on what it could be or how we can treat our plants to help them survive? Yeah, when you said cucumbers, the very first thing that makes me think of cucumber beetles, they are so small. And there are some insecticides that you can use. You can use some spinosad, neem oil, and you can use some pyrethrums or permethrins to actually treat it. But neem oil, if you use neem oil when it's above 80 degrees, it burns a plant. And I know it's organic, but it actually has a level of phytotoxicity and it will burn and kill the plant also. So you can use some of the insecticidal soaps and oils but read the labels. Some of them will say don't apply over 80 degrees. And I would venture to say that it's either cucumber beetles or flea beetles. Flea beetles will create a lot of tiny little bitty holes in the leaf. And sometimes there reaches a point of severity where it cannot be saved. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, then we got uh, a question from David Hopper that says, how are seedless watermelon seeds developed for field planting? Yeah, so they actually require a pollinator. It's a an unfertilized cross. So they'll actually it's it's we're complicated with the chromosomal count. You'll have some watermelons that are diploid, tetraploid, and there's another one out there. So a seedless watermelon's planted, but you have to have another one that actually pollinates it. So a seedless watermelon itself, from what I've gathered, doesn't actually produce pollen. You have to have another one that produces the infertile seeds inside the seedless watermelon. Does that make sense? Sort of. Um, you can find a bunch, bunch of different varieties on there. Um, a lot of websites will sell you seedless watermelons, but you have to have another one near it to actually pollinate it. I never knew that. Yeah. Um, it says, we got one that says, what are your favorite or recommended tomatoes to grow in Tennessee? My favorite is a, is a newer series called Chef's Choice. You can't find the plants anywhere, but you can buy the seeds. Chef's Choice Yellow, Chef's Choice Orange, and I'm planting one this year called Chef's Choice Black. It's a whole series of tomatoes that were all American selection winners, and I've grown some of the Chef's Choice every year. And man, I think they put on and put on and put on. Um, and one of my pictures was the Chef's Choice Orange, and they're just a good orange baseball sized tomato. Awesome. It says, I have an heirloom tomato plant and pole beans on my back patio in its original plastic bucket. Should I transplant it into a bigger container? I don't have a backyard for these, but hoping I can keep onto these plants. Yeah, the, the tomato itself probably needs an area two or three feet by two or three feet. Just from a, a that's just a general recommendation on tomatoes, about two feet by two feet, three feet by three feet. If you can move it to a bigger container, 
And you can sometimes go to nurseries and buy these giant tree tubs they use. Ideally, that would be the best way to actually grow it. And the beans are the same way. Now, beans, depending on the type of bean, they'll, they could have to have some kind of a staking. So. All right. It says, you mentioned flea beetles. I've never had flea beetles before this year, but they are all over everything. Do you have any, an organic solution that can get rid of them or prevent them? Uh, I use an inorganic way called seven this year. Now, I know people are concerned about seven and, and bees. I use it on my eggplants, but my eggplants aren't blooming yet, so I'm not going to affect the bees. So I broke down and used some seven, but you can also use the neem oil. You can use another organic insecticide called spinosad, um, and you can use any of the pyrethrums. I believe there's a difference between pyrethrum and permethrin. Permethrin is the synthetic form, the man-made form of pyrethrum, which I think the original pyrethrum is derived from chrysanthemum flowers. But if you're re using some of those like the neem oils, they have to be applied when the temperatures are cooler or they'll burn the plant. Awesome. It says, I planted strawberries this year. Should I let them produce fruit or let the energy go to letting the plant grow and spread? I would break. I know this is going to be terrible. You plant them because you want strawberries. The first year on most fruits, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, you need to break off the fruit. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. And I think this might be our last one. I keep thinking our squash is going to grow, but nothing yet. The flowers keep opening and closing. Anything we can do? Um, I wonder if you have the male flowers. And my squash just started kind of blooming about three weeks ago. I'm just now starting to get a little bit of fruit coming on. So squash will have male flowers, and they'll also have the female flowers. So if it's been blooming for a couple of weeks, I bet you don't have any female flowers yet, and they're going to come on later. So don't panic yet. If the plant's healthy overall, you've got nothing to worry about. Let's see. I think that I think that does it for all of our questions. That's the most questions I've ever had for a webinar. Well, it looks like I have two that just popped up from private. Okay. <clears throat> Is cleaning from horse stalls after composting good soil for plants or flowers? Will it make soil more pliable or softer? It is very grainy and pelleted currently. All right. There's a couple of herbicides called aminopyrrolids. I know all of y'all will remember that word. It's called grazon and duracor. It's found in hay. It passes through a horse, cow, sheep, and goes into the manure and lasts about two years. This has been an issue for the past couple of years. Someone goes to their horse barn, they get all the horse manure out, they put it on their gardens, the herbicide is still in the manure. So if you're getting horse manure from somebody, make sure, just ask them, do you use, what type of herbicides do you use on your hay? If they're in a class called amino pyrrolids, leave that manure there. It's not going to be worth your time to actually use it. If it's good, safe manure, it needs to be out of the animal anywhere from 120 to 150 days before you apply it to something you're going to eat. So it needs to be good and composted down. Now, Kelsey talked about all the composting. So is seven dust still good for ridding plants of harmful insects? Yeah, I use seven dust sometimes. I've had some issues with flea beetles in my garden. And uh, I used that at the beginning, try to get some of my uh, flea beetle problems under control. And it's worked out really well on my eggplants this year. Now, I plant a pretty big garden. I probably have 50 tomatoes out, probably 50 peppers. So I, I grow a very large garden. So Let's see, we just have one more come in. It says, moving into a house from an apartment at the end of the month, is it too late to plant transplants or start a garden? No, you have plenty of time. You can. I plan on starting more squash. I haven't even planted my beans this year yet. I know that's crazy. People are like, you're crazy. No. I think beans really like the warmer soil, and I'm going to plan on planting beans until probably next week. Uh, you can still plant plenty of squash, squash, cucumbers, zucchini, all those things can be planted right now. If you can find tomatoes, I would buy them and go ahead and plant them. For the most part, tomatoes from a transplant, you'll get fruit in about 50 days. So roughly, you'll get fruit in the middle of August when everybody else's tomatoes are starting to kind of go down in growth. All righty. We're a little bit over time. Um, it says, somebody asked about the PowerPoint. Yes, I'm going to be, we've recorded this, and I will be 
sending off the uh, a follow-up email with the presentation and the recording. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Lucas and Kelsey. You guys um, just gave so much good information, and I hope everyone was able to benefit from that. I'd also like to thank everyone that registered and was a part of the webinar audience and also um, asked questions. It's a really important part of, of webinars and, and that this whole virtual um, education that we are you know living in these days. So our next webinar is going to be mid-September, so be on the lookout for registration links and emails that will give you more information on that. Like I said earlier, the webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on our website, um, but if you have any further questions, feel free to, to contact me at caleb.powell at tn.gov, that's C-A-L-E-B dot P-O-W-E-L-L -L at T-N dot gov. A follow-up email, you can be expecting that at the end of the week, and that will have the presentation and the webinar recording link. Um, if there's nothing else, then everyone have a great rest of your week, and we really appreciate y'all.